Hello everybody, welcome to a new episode of The Dissenter. I'm your host as always, Ricardo Lopez, and today I'm joined by Drs. Leslie Newson and Peter Richardson. I've already had Dr. Richardson on the show and they're both from the University of California, Davis, and they are authors of a recent book that we're going to focus on today, A Story of Us, and you look at human evolution. So, Drs. Newson and Richardson, welcome to the show. It's a pleasure to everyone. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. Okay, great. So, I mean, let's start perhaps with some more general questions. Uh, because, I mean, when we look back into our evolutionary history and because we have cumulative culture and we are influenced by the cultures we live in, how do you look at the relationship between biology and culture? You start, darling. Well, I, I think of, uh, of uh, culture as being part of human biology, in fact, part of the biology of many social species. So uh, social learning culture is, uh, uh, turns out to be a quite widespread phenomenon. And in the case of humans, it's a, it's a really major part of our biology. Our whole uh, uh, life history is built around exploiting uh, uh, culture, it seems to me. So it's, uh, uh, it's a, uh, uh, a foundation stone of our, of, our, of our biology, I would say. Mm -hmm. So I, I think of it, can I just say, I think of it as being like something that kind of emerges. I mean, with, with, with when a whole lot of conspecifics who are social get together. So if you have a whole bunch of ants that get together, mm -hmm. they, can, they make an anthill. A whole bunch of humans get together they make a culture. And it, it, it's on that level. Nobody could say that anthills aren't part of the biology of ants, and, and nobody can say that culture isn't part of the biology of humans. Does that make sense? Yes, it makes sense. And then I guess we also have the concept of gene culture co-evolution, and in that way, culture can also drive genetic evolution, at least to some extent. Well, that's been Pete's thing forever, hasn't it, darling? You go ahead. <laughs> yeah, so uh, uh, it seems to me it's, it's sort of trivially obvious that uh, most of the environments that we live in are culturally constructed. Uh, our social environments, our physical environments, uh, we build housing, uh, we build uh, uh, terraces, we alter the uh, geomorphology of, the, of our surroundings, uh, we wear clothing, so uh, uh, particularly in important in, in temperate and cold climates. And, and so, uh, and we drag, uh, we adapt uh, culturally to, uh, to uh, uh, pretty exotic environments like the high Arctic or, or the high elevations like the Andes and the Himalayas. And uh, so all of those things then uh, generate selective pressure on our on our genes. So people who live in cold climates are tend to be compact, have short limbs like other organisms that live in cold environments. And uh, uh, so that, uh, and, and uh, things, the famous example is uh, dairying and uh, adult lactase uh, persistence. Uh, uh, so people that uh, have a tradition of dairying uh, are able to uh, uh, digest uh, the milk sugar lactose as adults, uh, whereas mammals generally shut down the production of that enzyme uh, as, around the time of weaning because we, uh, most mammals are never going to see a uh, molecule of, of lactose again in their life. And that would be true of non-dairy and human populations as well. And, and non-dairy human populations have uh, low frequencies of adult lactase uh, persistence. So, uh, and it, it, it seems as if there's probably going to be a plethora of, the, of examples like that. Uh, so, for example, high Arctic people have uh, uh, a, a specialized fat uh, metabolism because they're eating such large quantities of, of marine mammals and, and fish that are, that are high, for example, in polyunsaturated fatty acids, and they have special enzymes to deal with that. Uh, 
Uh, and that would also apply to human psychology, right? I mean, across cultures, people also differ in terms of certain aspects of their psychology. Yes, yeah, so that uh, uh, there are certainly uh, uh, psychological differences between people in, in different cultures, but, but then there are uh, these uh, similarities. So uh, all human societies have uh, 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 fairly large-scale cooperation up among people. So humans are, are prone to, to have uh, bonds to uh, many other people. I mean, spouses, are, uh, uh, apropos of uh, pair bonding, I mean, we have uh, bonds with our spouses. But we also have bonds with friends and neighbors and co-ethnics. And we, we uh, treat our groups as if they're an important part of our of our psychology. So that there are these. And, uh, and, we also have, and we also have and we also have bonds to our dogs, our horses. I feel pretty bonded to my phone. You know, in my car, it's yeah. we're kind of crazy bonded, aren't we? Very <laughs> flexible. Yeah, and, and talking about flexibility, where does our behavioral flexibility come from? Does it have anything to do with the fact that during our evolutionary history there was lots of environmental fluctuations? Well, it, it seems to me that... Uh, 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 yes, in the in the Pleistocene, in the ice ages, at least, uh, uh, there were these massive uh, climate fluctuations, and and it seems as if uh, uh, people are uh, adapted to uh, adapt to those kinds of fluctuations with cultural uh, changes. So culture can uh, evolve more quickly than genes, so it can track these high amplitude. Uh, climate fluctuations. But we also deploy it uh, most spectacularly, I think, in the Holocene uh, to spatial variation. So you can think of the Holocene as a uh, massive adaptive radiation in which we uh, became adapted to exploit the peculiarities of, of different environments, the plants that live in different environments. So uh, it, uh, particularly agricultural populations. I mean, we have this enormous variety of, uh, of potatoes and wheats and other uh, crop plants that are specifically adapted to particular soils and climates and so on. And uh, uh, so we have uh, uh, adapted to the spatial variation on the earth in the, in the Holocene in a, in a spectacular fashion. Uh, and it, it, that wouldn't be possible if, unless we were uh, prepared to be quite flexible about uh, 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 yeah, just take diet. I mean, we can, uh, some human populations are nearly entirely carnivorous, particularly high latitude uh, populations. Other, other human populations are practically uh, uh, complete vegetarians and, and get very little uh, uh, animal protein or, or modest amounts of animal protein. So uh, uh, we uh, even our digestive physiology is is highly flexible, not to mention our our behavior in in other respects. Mm -hmm. And is there any relationship between behavioral flexibility and culture? I mean, is the fact that we are more behaviorally flexible than it seems other species that we have things like cumulative culture, for example? Right. If if we weren't uh, uh, flexible, it's hard to imagine how we could uh, how we could adopt all of these uh, uh, varieties of, of cultural adaptations, behavioral variety. Uh, our social organization is sharply different uh, uh, from one ecological circumstance to another. Not to mention uh, uh, diets. Our toolkit is highly variable, uh, and that flexibility seems to be. Uh, necessary to uh, uh, to adapt culturally rather than 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 by anatomical or physiological features mm -hmm. I, I like the way that joe henrik puts it when he says that we're born with the expectation that we are going to learn from people around us and and be, and sort of our brain will become programmed um to fit into the physical environment and the social environment and the cultural environment in which we're born it, that's kind of the expectation where 
we won't go so far as to say it's a blank slate, but there's there are a lot of boxes to be filled in <laughs> after we're born based on what our environment is telling us. And, mm -hmm. and, yeah. And that's when we get into things like, for example, content, content dependent biases, context dependent biases, and other things like that, other cognitive mechanisms like that. Right. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. I, I'm always very confused about cognitive mechanisms because okay. are they are, are they are these cognitive mechanisms created as we experience life, or are they cognitive mechanisms that are inbuilt? It's very very hard. I I I, I feel that I'd like to have two different kind of words for cognitive mechanisms. Do you? I don't know. Well, yeah, part, sorry. Yeah. Part of the problem, it seems to me, is that it's very difficult to uh, disentangle uh, the building blocks of, of cognition and, and psychology because uh, uh, we not only co-evolve uh, uh, in the evolutionary timescale, but we co-develop. So culture and, and genes are uh, we're acquiring our culture as our neurobiology matures, right? Our brains grow and, and synapses are put together. And so it's, although in principle, the I, uh, uh, cultural ideas, uh, culturally based uh, 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 determinants of our behavior and genetic uh, determinants of our behavior, conceptually very distinct, but when you actually uh, confront an ad adult organism that's behaving, uh, where where each what contribution genes and culture made to each behavior is is really difficult to disentangle. It seems to me, at the, when, given the present uh, 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 techniques. Mm -hmm. But at Methods. least at least for us to know that a particular cognitive mechanism has a biological basis, we can compare ourselves to other closely related animals and also perhaps look across cultures and uh, at things like uh, human universals. Right, if there are any human universals. <laughs> In other words, <laughs> okay. uh, uh, people point to human universals like marriage, but uh, uh, I mean some cultures barely have marriage at all and, and others have Varieties of, of marriage that are that are highly uh, uh, variable. So uh, is uh, so even human universals uh, are uh, have a lot of variation laid on top of them. And as Darwin taught us, variation is what is the engine of selection, uh, or excuse me, is the engine of evolution. Uh, so uh, uh, I think it's important to. Uh, not to uh, get too uh, uh, hung up on on human universals. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because uh, you know, back in the early nineties, I think I think it was Donald Brown who published yeah. that book, Human Universals, and he listed hundreds of them. So I'm not sure if that still holds any water or not. Well, you can look at that list of universals and and many of them are uh, are not just human universals but ape universals and and even mammal universals, mammal universals and and things like that so uh, uh, and others of them are uh, are human universals like marriage is a good example it seems to me that it's okay uh, humans what's really fundamental it seems to me to be about humans is that that mothers can't raise their offspring uh, without uh, help from somebody else. And, and very often <clears throat> the fathers or the father's relatives have, uh, are involved in, in supplying the resources that, that the mothers need to raise those uh, uh, expensive uh, kids. But not always. Uh, Siobhan Mattis Madison has this nice paper on, with co-authors on what does she call them? Dispensable males. There are a few cultures scattered around the world where, where males are economically unimportant, and and they're just they're sort of like uh, normal mammal males. They don't do anything except chase skirts. And uh, uh, 
Uh, so uh, that's uh, one extreme where marriage is, uh, or let's put it uh, uh, more concretely, male contributions to uh, uh, to the economy that supports women and kids, uh, uh, they, they just don't make much of a contribution. Uh, whereas in other, many other societies, uh, men are deeply involved in 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 the uh, child care and provision of, of mothers. Mm -hmm. So before we get into the sort of story you present in your book, would you like to add anything, Dr. Newsom? Uh, um, to the, the whole idea of, of um, human universals. Mm -hmm. I think that it's, uh, I mean, one thing that came to mind is the idea that there could also be cultural evolutionary convergence. So if you're stuck with a, with a body like ours, when one thing that's universal is we all have this human body, right? And, and there, there's, you know, so we have to walk on, on two legs. You know, we have these mammary glands that we feed our kids with. I mean, there's a lot of, there's a lot of biology that means that culture is gonna, is gonna, uh, is gonna be the obvious way to solve the problem and cultures are gonna converge on that, on those obvious ways of solving the problem. So mm -hmm. that, that, that could be a, a reason for the universality of certain traits. Okay, so let's go all the way back to the early stages of our evolutionary history. What do we know about our last common ancestor with chimpanzees and bonobos? So we, of course, in some ways know absolutely nothing. Um, it's all speculation. Um, but we did start our book seven million years ago with the last common ancestor because we felt there's actually there is there is some evidence on which we can speculate for one thing we're pretty sure that it was living in a tropical forest simply because there are so few fossils and and tropical forests uh, living animals don't leave many fossils because the soil isn't 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 good for preserving bones teeth and that kind of thing so that gives us a clue that they lived in a tropical forest. And also they were apes. I mean, we don't know if they were like chimps, we don't know if they were like bonobos or gorillas or something entirely different, but we know they were apes. And so there's this body, this ape body, and a, and a bunch of ape biological problems that, that this last um, common ancestor was stuck with. Apes have very slow growing, expensive, hard to raise kids. And, and that meant if they were like other mammals, and, and indeed like um, chimps and bonobos today, the mothers were working really hard to keep those babies alive, right? And, and you know, it took them years. It, I mean, it, it, in orangs, uh, it takes five years, approximately, from birth to weaning. I mean, that's, it's extraordinary. And in that five years, the little baby doesn't just need support and, and protection. It, it needs to learn how to be an orangutan or learn how to be a chimp. And, and, and so, I mean, there's a huge amount of work that, that done there. And I think it's reasonable to suspect that it was done in the normal mammalian way with, with, the, with the mother doing all the work. And so, so that seemed like a good part to good way to start <laughs> the book, talking about that work. Mm -hmm. uh, but if we knew exactly, uh, for example, aspects of the sociality of this common ancestor, would we get new insights into uh, how we evolved in, in terms of our current species, Homo sapiens? So it seems to me that uh, uh, that it's not a coincidence that humans evolved from other apes rather than uh, so this highly cultural adaptation that we have is uh, uh, is unique, right? We well, we know lots of other animals have a fair amount of culture, uh, but not nearly as much as we have. So how do you explain that? The singularity of of human culture, and and it seems to me it's it's got to result from 
all of these animals uh, have been living in the same Pleistocene environments, for example, uh, and they didn't e evolve in this, uh, quite the same way humans did. So that uh, suggests that uh, uh, it's our ape ancestry that uh, provided uh, uh, what we used to call pre-adaptations that uh, uh, led humans to become uh, super cultural organisms. And so one thing that uh, that all of the uh, uh, the apes have in common is relatively large uh, brains. So uh, it seems like that might be important. Uh, they all have hands. Uh, they all have this long juvenile uh, uh, period that Leslie just mentioned. And uh, so these are these are uh, things that uh, that uh, uh, we've capitalized on in human evolution. And uh, so it seems likely that uh, 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 those are the reasons why we became this uh, hypercultural uh, species, not not some elephant or some uh, uh, some gazelle or or uh, or a beaver or wh whatever else you want to you want to, a bug, an insect of some kind, uh, uh, and that I think is the fundamental reason why we're interested in 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 apes and our ape ancestry. Mm -hmm. But but I think that what apes did, oh, what, sorry, what, what chimps and bonobos did, that that side of the family, if you like, of, of the, of that, that branch of the descendants of the last common ancestor, they stay in the tropical forests. The tropical forests were shrinking and they stayed in the tropical forest. Our ancestors left the tropical forest and I think that's relevant too and so in our book we speculated that that was important because by leaving the tropical forest it necessitated a different way of bringing up offspring um, that it meant that mothers had to band together with the help of their older children to look after the infants. And so they had a, diff a different kind of sociality. They, they were no longer in this kind of fission fusion thing where mothers and, and their offspring went off together, more or less often alone, um, to forage. But they actually took turns foraging because it's a, it's a very hard environment for mothers and babies in a you know, outside in the dry where there aren't many trees and um, the food is, it, there's plenty of food there, but it's, 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 there's large packets of food which are, are far apart and that, 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 and the, wa and the water is scarcer. It's, it's, it's a very different kind of foraging environment, hard for mothers and babies. Mm -hmm. And I guess that that move from the rainforest to the savanna also led to our changing our diets and perhaps some uh, anatomical aspects like the evolution of our bipedality and so on. Right. And the bipedality is important because it allowed our hand to specialize in ways that uh, made uh, uh, things like tool stone tool napping possible, and, and uh, uh, that seems to involve uh, freeing our hands from having a, a dual function of locomotion and, and manipulation to one that was specialized for manipulation. Mm -hmm. but, the, but the important thing about being in a group where you have a whole bunch of mothers and older, uh, older offspring looking after the babies is that it's a different learning environment because you're not just learning from your mother. You're learning from a lot of different, more experienced individuals. And therefore, there's, there'll be selective pressure on having the kind of brain that can compare models, that can compare what Auntie Hilda's doing with what, um, with what mom's doing and compare cousin Joe or whatever. It's, you know, that's a completely different problem than the problem faced by baby um, chimpanzees who, who just have to figure out what mom's doing and, <laughs> and why and, uh, and do their best to copy. 
so so I think that that that, that was socially important just and mm -hmm. affected but the brain. You mentioned earlier the uh, bias forces in in cultural evolution. So the uh, uh, increase in the size of the social networks that that uh, kids were embedded in uh, potentiates the use of those biases. They work on on cultural variation, picking the best technique out of the ones that you observe. And if you only observe one, if you only observe what mom does, uh, you can't exercise a bias. And and so biases are, are a potent way of, of getting uh, the increasing the frequency of uh, new traits in a population, say if the environment changes and and it becomes uh, valuable to uh, adopt a novel technique, then uh, those bias forces can uh, pump up the frequency of it rather rapidly compared to the situation if there isn't any opportunity to exercise those selective imitation uh, processes. Mm -hmm. I understand. Uh, in the book, you talk about you use the term social tools to refer to things like vocalizations, hierarchy, grooming. Uh, why do you use that term? And I, I mean, the, uh, is it referring to things that are part of our evolved repertoire, for example? So, so I, I came, well, I heard the term social tools from an archaeologist who is talking about, um, you know, some, some kind of device which she felt had a religious function or whatever. And she said, well, these, of course, are tools. They're social tools. And I, and I thought, oh, is it, what a wonderful, wonderful idea. Because a social tool is something that you invent um, in order to make the, the, the whole kind of social thing work better. And, of course, so many things that we have. I mean, language is the... Is, is a really important social tool. And, the, and there are so many. As soon as you have the phrase, you can just think of money. Money's a social tool. A weapon is a social tool, right? I mean, there are so many. So, humans humans have in, have in, Religion is a social We've invented so many wonderful social tools. And so, and so then I started thinking, well, wait, wait. Chimps have social tools, too. Apes have social tools. Grooming is a social tool. It's an invention, sort of. I mean, it's 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 a difficult thing to work out what's what's genetically evolved and what's invented. But but yeah, I mean, voc vocalization, screaming—they're all social tools. And uh, and so, lots of animals have these have a few social tools. Humans have so many, <laughs> so many. Yeah, uh, we've already mentioned bipedal apes and bipedal hominins, I guess we could call them. Uh, and in the book, uh, you position them at 3 million years ago. So are we talking here about any specific hominin? I don't think we can talk about any specific hominin. <laughs> I mean, we have we have a, a bunch of skeletons, partial some pretty complete skeletons, but we we tried to stay away from naming which particular skeletons were most important because, you know, another skeleton could be found in, tomorrow and it would change everything. So. Mm -hmm. Right. And the paleo, paleoanthropologists love to argue about which Australopithecine is most closely related to the early Homo, but I don't know. <laughs> Uh, and we know very little about the behavior of any of them, including the early homo. So it's, uh, uh, it's certainly something one could speculate about, but uh, plenty of people have, have speculated about it. Mm -hmm. But uh, early homo, we are talking about early humans or not? Or is the term humans, does the term humans mean <coughs> another thing? Well, it seems to me that the... Uh, the first uh, member of our genus, Homo, uh, is the first human by by some standard. Uh, uh, yet, uh, the first uh, uh, Homo was just a, uh, a peculiar kind of Australopithecine. Uh, looked at it from a strictly biological rather than from a uh, taxonomic pigeonholing point of view. And so, uh, well, there's a, there would have been a smooth uh, 
gradation from the uh, from whatever Australopithecine species or or species might might have been more than one uh, contributed to the uh, to the genes of the of the stem. No, but uh, I mean we were talking about uh, early Homo, and I was asking if that's the same as humans or not. So, w would you like to add anything? Well, uh, just that uh, there's a taxonomic definition of of the genus Homo, and uh, and that's humans by some uh, standard, uh, uh, but but it's an, uh, a taxonomic artifice, really, in the sense that the uh, earliest Homo would have been another kind of Australopithecine looked at biologically. Uh, rather than from the uh, formal systematics sense. So uh, how would the earliest homo have differed from the average Australopithecine behaviorally? We don't have much of an idea about that. Uh, uh, all the, the earliest homo is just important because that's a particular Australopithecine that uh, evolved into us and all the others uh, uh, went extinct. Uh, uh, Eventually. What, what, the way we handled this in the book, because we wanted it to to be, we wanted to we wanted to gloss over all that hard species stuff and just <laughs> and just talk in general terms. So we said, okay, certainly by 1.5 million years ago, there were some really humany looking uh, animals around, mm -hmm. and they had brains that were bigger than any Australopithecine. Some of them, not all of them, uh, but some of them had brains that were bigger than any Australopithecine or, or any ape today or then. So, so we we just kind of went bang to 1.5 million years ago and just said, yeah, there were humans by then. And um, and then looking at the human and the size of the brain, then we made some we did some speculation about how the behavior might have been different from. <laughs> from our speculation about what Australopithecines' the behavior was. We did a lot of speculation in the book, but we, we were honest about the speculation, and we, we explained the reasons, the theory, and the evidence behind our speculation. Mm -hmm. So, when we think about our evolutionary history, particularly anthropologists talk a lot about how our life histories evolved. And, for example, recently I interviewed David Bjorklund and we talked about uh, adding uh, a few stages, like, for example, childhood and adolescence that other closely related apes lack. Uh, so. Did, our, did the evolution of our life histories influence the evolution of other of our traits? Yeah, absolutely. Um, we, it's impossible to know for sure when those evolved, but sometime between a million and a half years ago and a hundred thousand years ago, they must have evolved. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the long childhood, um, again, it's speculation, but one can speculate about why it would have been adapted to have a long childhood. And I think that's partly because the children were doing a lot of work. Um, mm -hmm. They were really contributing to the family from maybe age five. Um, and in the course of contributing to the family, they were learning how to be a family member, a team member. Um, and so that by the time they were ready to reproduce, they they'd learned they gained a lot of social tools. <laughs> they knew how to be part of a team. Mm -hmm. So around one hundred thousand years ago, we we're already talking about Homo sapiens. I mean, humans like us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah. Sorry. Yeah, it's just that we it's and it's we can't really say much about what happened between in in my opinion we can't really say much definite between what happened between a million and a half years ago and a hundred thousand years ago, but one thing we do know is that during that time there were a lot of periods of 
of climate chaos. Um, during that time, the brain evolved to be much larger. Uh, there were very, even though there were some quite small brain um, animal, human type animals found uh, up until about 300,000 years ago, they they disappeared by by 100,000 years ago. And we don't know, we can't, I can't even imagine a story to explain that. I mean, I guess I could fabricate it, but I, there's, it won't be evidence-based. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, but 100,000 years ago, we were already talking about humans that were behaviorally like us, or were they still lacking some behaviors, or, or were there some aspects of their psychology that weren't present yet? Well, they were culturally much more simple. Um, they, they, the, the actual um, it would appear. What? Well, you're be You're probably best to answer this, darling. What? What would you say for that? Yeah. Well, the, they were certainly not uh, uh, culturally modern uh, in the sense that uh, uh, people were, say, thirty thousand years ago. In, uh, in our next step, that's the distinction between a hundred thousand years ago and and 30,000 years ago. But uh, uh, there are flashes of technological complexity and artistic productions and things like that in the, in the African fossil record uh, on the part of anatomically modern Homo sapiens uh, uh, before they left Africa. So sometime between a, something like 100,000 years ago and something like uh, 40, 50,000 years ago when humans, uh, modern humans left Africa, uh, uh, there was quite a bit of, of modernization, and, and the, uh, why that modernization occurred is, is uh, uh, subject to, uh, well, there are several hypotheses. It, uh, one of them is that there was some kind of uh, even single locus mutation that, that converted us, that made us modern somehow. Uh, uh, other people think it was a accumulation of, of things, so perhaps a cultural, uh, mostly a cultural evolutionary process. I'm prone to think that, uh, that, the, uh, uh, that the very highly variable uh, uh, period of in, uh, marine isotope stage four and stage three in the, in the last ice age, uh, 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 particularly stage three, were hyper variable. And so you might wonder that so humans were uh, very rare, apparently, throughout most of our history. There's no indication that humans were ever very common. But about 50,000 years ago, uh, human populations uh, started a, a steady increase. And that could uh, possibly have resulted from the fact that we were not very good competitors. Uh, we, to, to support the big brain, we had to be top carnivores. We had to eat a lot of meat and fat. And uh, at the same time, uh, that niche in Africa is is chock full of uh, very efficient predators, lions and leopards and and hyenas and wild dogs and and so we were going up against some of the uh, uh, best adapted uh, predators the world has ever seen, and we weren't doing too good, you might think. And then the uh, environment started to fluctuate more rapidly, and because we could adapt to those changes culturally, all of a sudden we had a, an advantage over our competitors that uh, heretofore no uh, human had had. And that was an, an, uh, a change in the environment, not a change in the, in the humans themselves. So you might imagine that the humans 30,000 years ago and 100,000 years ago were genetically uh, equivalent or to, to all intents and purposes. And that uh, it was cultural evolution driven by climate change that uh, this high, very highly uh, a variable climate uh, that uh, led to the evolution of, uh, of modern human societies and, and technologies. Mm -hmm. so, so what we're suggesting is that it's not a, a somehow change in the gene or change in the cognition, but if you like another social tool, you know, or a set of social tools that, that, that during these times of extreme climate disruption where you, you know, it, within a within a single human lifetime, the average global temperature could change something like five degrees Celsius. 
I mean, just extraordinary. I mean, not greater than anything that people are speculating about climate change today. I mean, that, that was a, a, an amazing time, and people would have needed to rely on each other. And, and I'm I, suggesting that social tools were developed, which made it possible for people to rely on each other, to share information, to put their heads together, um, and take and take advantage of the chaos to some extent, because you know you can you you know all chaos can be good for survival um, if you can figure out a way of taking advantage of it, um, but it can also kill you, and and so it killed the other other hominins. It killed the the. Den the Denisovans that killed the Neanderthals, but it, it didn't kill our side of the family. <laughs> Isn't this period somewhere between 100,000 years ago and 50 or 40,000 years ago where we also see an explosion in terms of artistic creation and religious artifacts, or at least artifacts to which we attribute a religious meaning or purpose? Social tools, those are all the social tools. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, in, so then in the book you have two chapters, one in which you talk about societies from, uh, th uh, uh, from 30,000 years ago and another from 10,000 years ago. So why do you have two chapters for them? W were there big differences between societies from those two periods. Yeah. Well, society, go ahead, Karita. Well, I, I was going to introduce what I think you should say, which is to, to <laughs> I mean, what was really different was that the, the Ice Age ended and the, and the Holocene gradually began. And that meant that there was much, much, much more of the Earth that was habitable. And also, the chaos ended habitats were created and then so the human population could rise and start to live in different habitats um, and then get to know their nice new stable habitat that was evolving around them and so it wasn't that the humans were different but the human culture could have been different that was the reason why once the ice age ended people got different over to you darling what we Let's so, your uh, yeah, uh, so the period around 10,000 years ago is when uh, people started to experiment with uh, heavy use of plants uh, in their in their diets. And this in turn led to agriculture on the part of many populations, but not all of them. Eventually, everybody, be, you know, practically everybody became agricultural, but that was a <clears throat> process that was spread out over the whole of the Holocene, but uh, uh, even hunter-gatherers became much more specialized on localized resources. So the, the high Arctic people, the Inuit, uh, they were they were still evolving in the last thousand years. I mean, the 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 Inuit as we know them uh, archaeologically go back about a thousand years, and uh, uh, so the throughout the whole Holocene, people were getting more and more specialized at uh, exploiting local environments and more and more uh, agricultural for the most part. And agriculture is just one particular uh, system that, that uh, uh, is, can be adapted, as we talked about before, to highly localized environmental circumstances. So in the 30,000 years ago, people were, we think, preoccupied with this highly variable environment. Uh, by 10,000 years ago, they were pre preoccupied with uh, <clears throat> figuring out how to exploit these uh, newly stable environments. Mm -hmm. Right. So 10,000 years ago, we were already talking about uh, at least some of them agricultural societies. Well, the, uh, it's hard to know whether you would call them agricultural societies or not. So people were experimenting with planting crops uh, of mostly just wild seeds. They, they, <clears throat> uh, they, they may not have been domesticated for the most part yet, but people were sort of working in that direction. And <clears throat> so uh, these experiments then in some places, uh, uh, for example, the uh, 
Fertile Crescent uh, area. Uh, uh, people there got into uh, the uh, wheat and barley and, and crops like that very early. And, and partly it was because they were already into harvesting them in the um, uh, in the few thousand, last few thousand years of the Pleistocene. As the climate warmed up and got wetter, uh, people started to exploit these plants. And so the, the agriculture then uh, started to develop there. But agriculture uh, developed rather slowly, really. Uh, and there's an interesting uh, uh, paper that compared the rates of population increase in the, in the uh, incipient agriculture times to the uh, and early agricultural times to the population growth rates in Western North America, where there were no uh, no agriculture, uh, at least in for thousands of years. And the, for for several millennia, the rate of population growth in the two places was very similar. Uh, so the hunter gatherers were exploiting plant resources and and had population growth based on that. The Near Easterners were uh, already ex uh, uh, farmers, in some sense, they started to, to domesticate uh, plants and animals, and, and yet their population growth rate was still very slow. So we think of it, we call it the agricultural revolution, but it's, uh, but to my eye, it's not very revolutionary. It's, it's more evolutionary. It's, it's, it's uh, uh, on the millennial time scale, it's creeping along, but it's, it's not uh, like there's uh, a, a wild uh, burst of population growth than uh, 10,000 years ago or 8,000 years ago. There was a slow, steady uh, population increase. Mm -hmm. And, but and it, it, if you think about it, to make agriculture work, you need so many social tools. I mean, you need, I mean, you, you're sitting here on a piece of land, you put, you, you, you've got your crops, how are you going to stop somebody coming in and just like killing you and taking everything that you built up? I mean, you you and and it, then if you have a surplus of something and you don't have enough of something else, then you need trade. More social tools, I mean, are needed to make trade work. To you know, to create trust um, that will make trade possible. So it was the the invention. Of, the invention of agriculture wasn't just an invention of of let's grow some food. It was a whole invention of how it was going to work with the different people. And the, yeah, it was it was big. <laughs> it was very very complicated. Yeah. So um, I mean, when do institutions start appearing? Do we already have them in hunter gatherer societies or only in? society is based on agriculture um, I think it they certainly exist in hunter gatherer societies what do you think darling yeah so uh, hunting and gathering societies uh, the ethnographically known ones are heavily institutionalized uh, uh, things like marriage and kinship and and uh, uh, peacemaking and warfare and uh, 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 property rights, uh, they're, they're all pretty heavily institutionalized. I mean, the institutions are, are relatively simple compared to uh, complex societies where we have an extensive division of labor. Uh, but these social tools that Leslie's talking about uh, are institutions, at least if they're, if they're uh, culturally transmitted, uh, social tools are uh, another name for them is, is institutions. Uh, I tried to persuade Leslie to use the term institutions in the book, and she re said nobody, everybody confuses institutions in the sense that, that uh, uh, social scientists talk about them with organizations. So uh, we talk about the University of California being an institution, and, and to uh, sociologists, it's not an institution, it's an organization. The research university is an institution, the, the generic uh, principles by which uh, a huge number of, uh, of organizations uh, like the University of California uh, operate uh, is a research university. Anyhow, uh, she thought this was way too much for the for the average reader, and so <laughs> she talked about social tools. Right. Yeah. So 
with modernity did David did any did anything important change about how we interact with one another, our sociality? Can I just say before we get into modernity? Sure. Um, you that you one of the one of the things that you talked about was the evolution of social norms and institutions. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I uh, that I think we have to understand is that as soon as you have evolutionary dynamics in culture, you have the same kind of weird stuff happening as you do with biological or genetic evolution, like runaways. So, so you know, famously, the, the peacock's tail is huge and elaborate and crazy because of a runaway, a sec, you know, a sexual selection runaway. That, that happens in cultures in space. And, it's, and it, you know, it, it began in the Holocene. So like pyramids, like how weird is that? How, what a waste of time. And yet the only thing that can explain it, to my mind, although I'm waiting for somebody to suggest otherwise, is that it was just a runaway. I mean, maybe, they, you know, they built a little pyramid and, it, and, and everybody really enjoyed it. It was something everybody did together and it seemed like a good idea. And it, coincidentally, things were going pretty well socially too. So the pyramid seemed like this really great, you know, building a tomb for the pharaohs seemed like a really good social tool. So they, what did they do? Next year they built a bigger one. Ten years later they were building a really, really big one. Another 50 years and, you know, they were wasting their time on these incredible tool, <laughs> tombs. I mean, so, so, so the evolution of institutions includes these extraordinarily silly runaways, like like all those terracotta warriors or the stone circles in Europe, they they were just crazy. And even though that it, you know it's given us some really interesting artifacts to look at, it really must have got in the way of good old honest living, producing food, raising kids. So I just wanted to throw that out there. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so and about modernity, when did it start exactly, and did it come with new social tools? Ah, yeah. Well, I, I mean, I, I suppose any social tool to do with uh, allowing increased um, communication mm -hmm. um, and communication over distance. I think those were important social tools. We, we have this idea that modernity is related to a changing of the shape of people's social networks. So people no longer, no longer were embedded within a family and they no longer interacted with the wider population kind of through a family, but they started react, re interacting with the wider, more and more of them started reacting with the wider population as individuals. And anything that facilitated that, like businesses, that workplaces um, where people no longer worked among their family members, no longer worked as a family team, but started working as, an, as individuals, all of those um, were part of modernity. It was a, it, it, social tools that restructured um, the way people interacted. That, that, was, that was modernity's inception, if you like. Mm -hmm. But with our modern culture and modern technology, are they transforming us in any way? For example, early, earlier we talked about gene culture coevolution. Could it be that uh, new technology we use nowadays and different ways we interact could drive our evolution? You mean our genes will change? Mm -hmm. Well, they're changing all the time. Um, I mean, it, evolution never stops. I mean, it, it, if you have one lot of people having more children than another lot of people, and there's some kind of bias in that, genetically, though, I mean, evolution never stops. But one of the things that's really important about modern culture is that involves people limiting the number of children they have. Hmm. And, and, and no longer, people are no longer working within families to compete, to, to keep the family going, 
you know, to produce the next generation of family members. For almost all of human evolution, um, the humans have been within families, families that were competing to survive and, and, and to grow and to reproduce. Once we got out of the family, once we started interacting as individuals, um, that coincided with a, just an absolute plummeting in the number of children that people produced. And that, that's important. Um, so that has, that has two uh, <clears throat> evolutionary effects. Uh, one on, on genes. Uh, so the, the evolutionary biologist Stephen Stearns and his co-authors uh, a number of years ago used this uh, Framingham Heart Study, 40,000 nurses or something in, in the uh, Boston area, a large sample. And, and so they could detect a selection on on uh, the length of uh, women's reproductive uh, careers. Uh, so there, uh, there's been a, a small change in the uh, age of, uh, uh, reduction in the age of, of menarche and increase in the age of, uh, of uh, uh, cessation of ovulation. And so the, the length of women's reproductive careers is very slightly increased in that, in that sample, which is the kind of response you'd you'd expect uh, uh, from the demographic transition and people having small families. So there's now there's selection. It used to be women, all women had as many kids as they could, more or less. And now uh, uh, with a greatly constrained fertility, there's selection for increased uh, fertility. Now that's on genes and it's very slow. But uh, on the other hand, we have these cultural uh, groups that Anabaptists, uh, for example, and North American Anabaptists who still have something like natural fertility, uh, uh, total fertility rates uh, up to uh, around seven kids per per woman per generation. And uh, uh, so uh, uh, that's another uh, example of a cultural response to uh, uh, the, uh, the Anabaptists are be becoming ever more uh, numerous at a, at a uh, rapid rate in 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 uh, terms of of a few generations. Uh, uh, so uh, I calculated once that half of North Americans will be Anabaptists in a couple of hundred years. At the if everything keeps going at the rate it's going, which of course is a, a strong assumption. But uh, 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 the, another way of putting it is that modernity is not uh, demographically sustainable. At the, selection pressures on genes would take a long time to fix the demographic transition, but, uh, but uh, cultures can respond much more quickly. So uh, 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 the, uh, who knows what the fate of modernity will be exactly, but it's, uh, uh, it, it's not, uh, modernity is not uh, ecologically sustainable and it's not demographically sustainable either and under uh, present circumstances. So, uh, Evolution is never going to stop, I don't think, neither so, biological nor cultural. Yeah. So do you think that group selection will have, uh, will play a big role here and perhaps uh, more collectivistic societies will be successful in the long run? Well, uh, in the sense that these Anabaptist societies are, are, uh, are successful, but of course, uh, uh, many societies that we think of as as collectivist, uh, like the East Asian societies, have very low. For they're they're highly modern in terms of their uh, demography. So uh, 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 they're just, as far as uh, we know, there are just a handful of societies that have effectively resisted the demographic transition. The uh, the uh, North American Anabaptists and the uh, ultra-Orthodox uh, Jews, and there's some hint that, although I don't think the data is up to uh, to careful uh, inspection, that uh, there's some sense that the Roma of, of Europe are uh, maintaining high fertility rates, uh, uh, but the very few societies are, and so it's a, I guess it's a kind of a group selection process in the in the sense that these. Uh, these isolated uh, groups uh, 
a handful of them have high fertility and the rest of us have low fertility. Mm -hmm. But would this group selection be cultural group selection, genetic group selection, or both? Well, it could be both, but the the uh, looking at that Stephen Stern's data, the the uh, uh, the genetic selection is is very weak, and that's typical of of selection. Is the, the reason that group selection on genes is it's mostly not very plausible is that the the uh, strength of selection on uh, genes is low relative to the uh, uh, migration rate. So uh, uh, group selection on gene genetic variation is generally speaking going to be very weak, uh, whereas uh, cultural groups like the Anabaptists have these uh, tight social norms, social tools that prevent them from uh, from being exposed much to uh, to modern uh, uh, ideas, and uh, so it's it, they they remain isolated. So the cultural variation between uh, Anabaptists and the general North American population doesn't seem to be breaking down. At least, I mean, there's certain the, the Anabaptists have always tolerated a certain loss of uh, people to the uh, to the wider community, but. Uh, they seem to hold on to on the order of 90% of their of their kids, and so uh, uh, that's plenty enough. And there's no, I mean, they evolved. The, the, the Anabaptists aren't static, uh, but there's no sign that they're evolving in a way that would uh, uh, make them, uh, uh, in the long run, uh, similar to you know, the average uh, uh, North American. Mm -hmm. So, apart from this demographic transition, would there be any other big challenges we have to deal nowadays? Well, I mean, it, uh, it seems to me that the uh, 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 ecological unsustainability of human populations is, uh, is another uh, critical uh, uh, existential issue, global climate change. Uh, and the other uh, associated environmental deterioration, uh, the, the, with uh, seven and going on nine billion of us, uh, all with uh, aspirations for high rates of consumption of, of food and other clothing and cars and other resources, uh, uh, that's, uh, it seems to me, to be a, a very big issue. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I think also we need to develop some social tools pretty quickly to help us to deal with the way that we are splitting up um, in, I mean, you know, people have different truths, different beliefs. If, if we are going to, we, we kind of got ourselves this global culture thing where, um, where we're trading uh, with, with people and connecting with people and yet we don't have the necessary social tools yet to help people f find out what is best for them to believe. Um, you know, there's a, 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 a very crowded field of information. Um, and children need to be helped um, to enter this world and make sensible decisions. Um, we all do. and and. Uh, up till now, we've been very good at, at the last minute finding a social tool <laughs> that would would make it uh, make this increasing um, social interaction possible. Let's hope we do. Yeah. Uh, do you think that we will ever be able to intelligently design our cultures, and would that even be possible? I don't. I don't think so. I mean, everybody who's ever tried. I mean, like I guess the Nazis tried and Stalin tried, and it, it's a disaster. We we just aren't intelligent enough to intelligently design anything. <laughs> well, we better we better get our smarts on here because if we don't, we're in trouble. Uh, but uh, you can be overly pessimistic about these things. Uh, so I read an interesting uh, history of uh, the. Uh, sort of the extended 20th century from a diplomatic uh, point of view. So uh, this author uh, started with a uh, 
uh, a conference in the, in the 1890s on uh, on uh, the treatment of prisoners during war and things like that, trying to make war fair a little less barbarous. And uh, and it, the conceit in this thing was everybody assumed that uh, nation states were completely uh, uh, free to do anything they wanted within their own borders. It, that the autonomy of the of the nation state wouldn't be infringed upon and then and then in the aftermath of, of world war ii uh uh we developed this concept of the rights of 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 humanity and and so uh the nation states or the agents of nation states uh, uh functionaries uh, uh could be uh, accused, tried, convicted, and hung for crimes of, against humanity, and and that was a a, a, a revolutionary social tool, if you want, uh, in the sense that over a period of a little more than 50 years, this uh, uh, absolute autonomy or the absolute rights of states to do whatever they wanted was uh, was uh, uh, done away with, and. So that that's some kind of uh, of progress in in uh, so we haven't uh, uh, developed uh, the social tools necessary to uh, manage our own future uh, well enough yet, but we've made some progress. Take the IPCC, the uh, the International Panel on Climate Change. Uh, uh, now it, we haven't. Uh, actually implemented the, their recommendations of the expert panel, but uh, the expert panel exists and we know what we have to do. Uh, and the uh, various things like the Paris Accord uh, are, uh, if they were implemented, are getting close to, to fixing the climate problem. So it's, yeah, we can, one can be too pessimistic, it seems to me. <laughs> uh, with the knowledge we have now, is it possible to predict our evolutionary future, the ways in which we will evolve? Well, we know that by the end of, well, it seems likely that by the end of this century, the human population will be declining mm. if trends continue. And there will be a big difference in the age structure of the population, um, and we don't and we don't seem to be preparing for that in any way. Mm -hmm. um, but it's it's perfectly predictable. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, it'd be nice if, um, if if those if those sort of things could be discussed as well as talking about climate change. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but uh, perhaps I was thinking more about, so we, we know what we know about our evolutionary past. Is it in any way possible to predict uh, if we know at least some of the select, selective pressures we're under now, how we will evolve in the future? Do we have enough knowledge to do that? So it, it seems to me that uh, uh, evol evolution is a notoriously unpredictable process. Uh, mm -hmm. There are just too many uh, contingencies that we can imagine to uh, uh, that might happen, uh, but might not happen. That uh, uh, it's it's extremely difficult to uh, uh, to predict. Uh, just take uh, 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 climate change as as an example. Uh, we have uh, uh, devoted an immense amount of effort to trying to uh, understand what the climate future will be like under different scenarios. But uh, the uh, uh, the predictions of these big models, uh, these uh, uh, coupled ocean atmosphere global climate uh, models, uh, uh, that differ by several degrees centigrade, depending upon which model you consult for a benchmark scenario of doubling of CO2 by the year uh, 2100. So uh, uh, the climate system is is unpredictable be, for because it's complicated and because uh, the models are just not up to stuff. Nobody knows, as far as I can tell, why those uh, 
those models uh, make such different predictions. Uh, uh, so that uh, the compared to the complexity of the problem, our tools for predicting the future are, are uh, uh, quite primitive. And then there's all the completely unpredictable things. I mean, we. I mean, in, in, in 1970, nobody really thought about CO2 being a problem. I mean, it just, and there could be something else lurking in, the, in our future that will suddenly discover is a problem. Or there, or there could be something rather wonderful that's going to help us solve problems. It's unpredictable. Yeah. So I have here a few general questions to, to end our interview. Uh, what do you think about, uh, since we've been talking about our revolutionary history and several different aspects of our sociality, what do you think about the discipline of evolutionary psychology and the sort of assumptions it makes about our revolution? <coughs> I, I, I'm not, I don't think that they're very explicit about, I, I mean, I, I know that evolutionary psychologists make a lot of assumptions, but they don't seem, they haven't made a list of assumptions. I, I you know, I mean, like the, this idea that humans are pair bonded, for example, they seem to think that humans find mates and they're pair bonded and then they have short term mates and long term mates and so there's a whole bunch of assumptions there but they aren't really clearly laid out um so it's it's hard to judge i mean i think there's some good evolutionary psychology going on but there's a lot of it that i i can't even read because it upsets me so much because it it doesn't seem to be screwed into reality really mm -hmm. Uh, but perhaps that idea, just to be more specific, about the what they call the environment of evolutionary adaptedness, and they say that uh, basically our current psychology is the um, is basically the same as it was, like for example, ten thousand years ago. That we have to look back in history to our. Uh, ancient societies, and they focus mostly on undergatherer societies, to know uh, how our modern psychology works. I mean, with things like gene culture, coevolution, and the uh, influence culture as on us, do you think that it is plausible to think that our psychology remained the same uh, uh, for the last? 10,000 years, for example. So it, What do you mean by psych? I mean, it's, it's hard. I mean, we do, what do we call it? What is the psychology? I mean, the, the human psychology hasn't been well defined. It's hugely flexible. It's hugely variable. Um, of course, psych, our psychology is different. Our psychology, the psych, your psychology last Wednesday is probably different than your psychology today. I mean, psychology is a moving thing. It's it's difficult. It's a really difficult question to answer. But maybe my dear husband can answer it. <laughs> well, if if they, uh, if you mean our the innate components of our psychology, they probably haven't changed very much. But the the, the beef I have with uh, many evolutionary psychologists, uh, not, I mean th that term is is a little bit fraught. Uh, but uh, uh, the idea that uh, that humans uh, in the Pleistocene were a lot like uh, uh, the ethnographic hunter-gatherers is uh, is a stretch because, uh, as we've been talking about, the last ice age was this uh, phenomenally variable uh, environment, uh, and the uh, uh, the this high frequency environmental variation seems to have been increasing during the ice ages over the Pleistocene. So our our uh, psychology was uh, being reshaped. Our brains were getting bigger for uh, to take an anatomical uh, feature that that we can measure in the in the paleoanthropological record. So uh, uh, so the our the our psychology has been a, a, a 
evolving, uh, moving target. But it's the innate parts of it probably aren't very different today than they were uh, uh, 50,000 years ago. Uh, but the cultural components of it have uh, changed a lot and were and are are e extremely variable. As as we know that uh, the cross cultural psychologists tell us that. Uh, 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 that there are substantial differences uh, uh, between the uh, psychology of uh, Westerners and Easterners and, and so on. So, uh, 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 so in a sense, yes, uh, we are what innately we are what evolution made us in the past, and and culturally to the same to some extent as well. So that that way of reasoning about things is is correct, but. But then you have to have the you, you have to have the 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 environment of evolutionary adaptiveness right, and uh, so uh, by my lights, the thing that that's really interesting about the Pleistocene is this uh, uh, variability and increasing variability over the course of the of the Pleistocene, and and that is something that, as far as I know. Uh, uh, the uh, many evolutionary psychologists, the dominant school of evolutionary psychology, uh, doesn't pay any attention to that. The, 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 for all the talk about the environment of evolutionary adaptiveness, they don't show much sign of interest in the uh, in the uh, what the environment of the Pleistocene was really like. Mm. And also, I'm not sure if you agree with this criticism, but also uh, since uh, they take undergathered societies as models of the societies we evolved in, isn't it the case that modern undergatherers are also different in many ways from the, the kinds of undergather societies we evolved in? Yes, uh, I mean, hunter-gatherer societies that we know ethnographically are pretty variable, and there's no reason to think that, uh, uh, I think there's every reason to think uh, that uh, the Pleistocene hunting and gathering societies were substantially different than, than Holocene ones. So we talked a little bit already about uh, the emphasis on plant resources in the diet, which is uh, so that California uh, hunter-gatherers at contact were uh, with Europeans were heavily into acorns and grass seeds and, and other plant resources. And uh, that seems to be uh, something that evolved in the Holocene and isn't characteristic of, of Pleistocene hunter-gatherers. So uh, they were much more into uh, game resources, much less into plants. And and uh, uh, so, yeah, I, I think that you have to think of, of Pleistocene societies uh, as uh, people who are living in a very different environment than the Holocene and, and were likely uh, uh, substantially different, at least in some dimensions, than, than living hunter-gatherers. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you think was the importance of social selection in our evolutionary history? And by social, social selection, I mean uh, people basically uh, socially selecting other people in the sense that, for example, uh, just to give an example, Richard Rangham talks about the self-domestication hypothesis where he says that during our evolutionary history we kind of uh, arranged ways of eliminating people who were very reactively aggressive and so we became less reactively aggressive and more pro-reactively aggressive. So what do you think about social selection? I think it was mostly done by mothers. Huh. So, I mean, one of the problems, I think, of trying to deal with hyper-violent adults is that they're already adults. But if you're a mother and you see that you have, you, you obviously want your children to get on, and if one of them is really, really difficult and uncooperative and violent and is, is potentially harming other, other, other children, then then that's the obvious time to kind of do that selection. It, it won't be. I mean, 
it won't necessarily be obvious, but you know, mothers have favorite children, <laughs> and, and and the the one thing you don't want is is for the children to be a danger to one another, and and dangerous, violent, uncooperative children are generally not favorite, and um, and so, I mean, I, I I think Richard is right about the social selection. I just don't think. He's right about thinking that it happens in adult, you know, uh, among adults. I think it happens in the family when these violent individuals are just starting out life. Mm -hmm. Well, I think it does also happen amongst adults. Uh, so Polly Wiesner was telling me about how uh, the Jew uh, Hoansi, the, uh, the Bushman people that she studies, deal with uh, with. Uh, extremely violent adults so that uh, basically uh, uh, Bushmen uh, every once in a while go berserk and, and start firing their poison arrows uh, at one and all and people are really afraid of this kind of thing happening uh, but everybody understands that people are under a lot of pressure and so sometimes people uh, do this uh, so you, you, what I got out of it uh, uh, Polly would probably correct me if if, if she were on this call. Uh, but uh, you get one free pass. Uh, you get one one berserk episode at, uh, in a lifetime. But if you uh, uh, if you uh, do a second one, then people decide you're crazy and you're scary. And uh, so the uh, the result is that uh, if uh, you, you do this, then you're exiled. Basically, uh, you you have to move with your family to a if your family will is willing to do it. You have to move to a satellite camp uh, away from the main uh, camp, and uh, and your status on the marriage market falls to nearly zero. So, Polly said uh, these guys that uh, 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 can't attract a wife, or at least if they attract a wife, it's an old wife that probably can't have any babies. So, so I mean that's a uh, Polly said that's not punishment. They're they're never punished. But on the other hand, from the point of view of of your genetic success, that's the you, know, you might as well kill them, right? If they can't attract a wife, they're not going to reproduce. So if it's just like we put uh, psychopaths in prison, where we greatly handicap their their fitness. So. Uh, 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 people who are uh, really can't fit in, uh, just uh, uh, they don't pass their genes on, uh, or at least they pass them on at a much lower rate. That's that's pretty strong selection, it seems to me. Right. So, uh, what do you think about the idea of there being a human nature? Well, do you think that we can talk about? a human nature does that make sense well i i um uh quite unsympathetic to the concept of human nature it seems to me that it's a it's an essentialist uh, uh concept it, uh, it's pre-darwinian no darwinian in their right mind would would uh, subscribe to the notion of human nature uh, on the other hand uh uh, uh many do so uh, E.O. Wilson, for example, has written a, uh, wrote a book in 1978, the title of which was On Human Nature. And uh, uh, what it turns out that he meant uh, by human nature is uh, not that he's not an essentialist, of course. Uh, what he meant was that uh, uh, that the uh, modern synthesis, uh, the modern evolutionary uh, synthesis, uh, uh, had all the tools that were necessary to explain human evolution. That's what he meant by human nature. Uh, uh, it didn't have anything to do with uh, uh, what I think of as, as human nature. Now I think he was wrong, but uh, uh, but at least he wasn't it wasn't crazy. But uh, it it goes back to these human universals. It seems to me that there are some human universals in the sense that uh, on average humans differ from uh, chimpanzees and every other species in in certain ways. I mean that's what species are right is uh, is a group of organisms that differ in some in some measurable way from all the other uh, from other species and uh, so there's uh, human nature, dog nature, 
every species has a nature in that sense. <clears throat> but uh, uh, but the uh, variation is what is really what's driving evolution. So we should pay attention to variation and and uh, take lightly these uh, uh, these things that we all share. Uh, they're interesting and uh, Im important in the sense that that, you know, that the fact that humans are different from chimpanzees is a is an important uh, uh, fact. We're a different species, but uh, evolution is not going to be driven by universals. It's going to be driven by variation. Mm -hmm. and, and, from, and from the point of view of studying human nature or, or, or imagining what human nature would be like, who could be? We're, we as humans are very, very ill-placed to work out what our nature is. It seems to be part of what we like that we get so involved in our culture that that is it, it, it would be difficult to be able to strip all that away um, and find any any a nugget of nature that might be somewhere. Right. So uh, I have here one final question that comes from a patron of the show, Bernardo Seixas. Uh, and he asks uh, if you think that biology needs to accept the extended evolutionary synthesis in order to incorporate cultural evolution, or if cultural evolution is compatible with the modern synthesis. That's for you, darling. You're the, you're the, you're the philosopher. <laughs> well, uh... I don't think the modern synthesis gave us the tools to deal with human culture, for sure. Uh, gene culture coevolution, for example, is something that uh, adherence to the modern synthesis like Steven Pinker make fun of. Uh, uh, but I think they make fun of something that's a real and important phenomenon. Uh, now, whether the extended evolutionary synthesis is uh, important for the rest of biology is uh, for other species is uh, uh, is a little bit more controversial in my mind. Uh, but it seems to me that uh, uh, the extended evolutionary synthesis people have made a, a good case that uh, uh, culture is pretty darn important in, in lots of, uh, of species. And uh, uh, they've also made the further argument that all forms of phenotypic flexibility can can potentially have uh, 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 consequences for evolution and furthermore that that there are other uh, non-genetic forms of inheritance that uh, uh, phenot uh, that are could be important in in uh, in evolution so uh, I think the the uh, the uh, book is still open on this issue. Uh, it, this is something that the uh, people are going to argue about for some period of time. And and in in some sense, it boils down to a semantic issue. Is it is it a big enough deal that we want to call it an extended evolutionary synthesis or the modern synthesis? People say, oh well, the modern synthesis is very flexible. It's it's not dogmatic about these things. We'll, we'll accommodate to whatever, uh, easily to whatever turns up. Uh, so then it, that makes it a, a, a semantic issue of, of no, with no real scientific content. Uh, uh, it's just what we want to call things. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the book again is a story of us and you look at human evolution. Just before we go, would any of you like to mention any places on the internet where people can find your work because this is an online show? Well, I, I have a website and Leslie's building a website. Uh, the Oxford University Press uh, website has a, a short version of uh, short uh, version of our book. Well, it has it has a synopsis. You can learn more about the book on on the Oxford University website. So that would be good. But uh, yeah, we're trying to in increase our online presence at the moment. 
<laughs> okay, fair enough. I will be leaving links to all of that in the description box of the interview. And Dr. Newson, Dr. Richardson, thank you a lot for taking the time to come on the show. It's been a pleasure to talk to you. Yeah, and you. It's been fun to talk to you. Hi guys, thank you for watching this interview until the end. If you like what I'm doing, please consider supporting it on Patreon or PayPal. All of the links are in the description box of the interview. This show is brought to you by people like you, so consider doing it. Otherwise, and if you like the interview, please share it, leave a like and hit the subscription button. This show is brought to you by Enlights, learning and development done differently. Check their website at enlights.com. I would also like to give a huge thank you to my main patrons and PayPal supporters Karen Litzke, Anne Blanchett, Perga Larsen, Lau Guerrero, Francis Ford, Hans Frederick Sunda, Ricardo Vladimir, Craig Healy, Adam Castle, Olaf Alex, Jonathan Wiesel, Jacob Klinkby, Matthew Whittingbird, Arno Wolf, Tim Hollacy, Eric Alenia, John Connors, Pauline Barron, Philip Force Connolly, Jerry Mueller, Herbert Gintis, Rutger Voss, Bo Weingart, Rebecca Newberger Goldstein, Dan Demetri, Robert Windegger, Rui Nassio, Arthur Coe, Zup, Marco Neves, Colin Holbrook, Susan Pinker, Thomas Trumbull, Bernardo Seixas, Pablo Santurbano, Simon Colombo, Jorge Spigny, Phil Cavana, Corey Clark, Mark Blythe, Roberto Inguanzo, Michael Stormir, Eric Neumann, Samuel Andreev, Tiago Nunes, Bernard Yugni, Alexander Dunbauer, Omer Hickson, Fergal Cusson, Evan Bodrenko, Al Herzog, Don Ross, Jonathan Leibrand, Oslo Bullet, Nathan Nguyen, Stanton T, Samuel Correa, Eric Hines, Mark Smith, J.W. João Eira, Tom Hummel, David Sloan Wilson, Yasila Des Araújo, Ethan Solon, Romain Roach, Dimitri Grigoriev, Diego Londonio Correa, Tom Roth, Yannick Punter, Adana Ruzmani, Charlotte Bliss, Miran B, Nicole Barbaro, Adam Hunt, Pavel Ostazevsky, Max Belby, Nelek Bach, Catherine and Patrick Tobin, Al Ortiz. My producers is our web, Jim, Frank, Lucas Tafini, Kian Gilligan, Sergio Codriano, Luis Caetano, Tom Van Egdam, Curtis Dixon, João Linhares, Benedict Mueller, Vega Guidi, Sardas France, and Nirvan Balachandran. And my executive producers, Michel Rogeski, Rosie, James Pratt, and Matthew Lavender. Thank you for all.